memorize what he said and continually keep repeating uh, what he was what he was um, what he was saying. Okay, um, I'm going to do this with, and then I go to listening. And so the way it's translated not talks, if they're not writing it down, as they're listening to it, they remind me that they were very, very disciplined. And they were very accustomed to learning things and repeating it often. And today in schools around the world, we don't use this kind of memorization anymore. It's even rare for you to learn one verse in America. It's very rare for you to even learn to do one verse by heart in fourth grade or fifth grade or sixth grade like that. Um, it's gone. Uh, I think I may have been at the tail end of it having to learn one verse in, in fourth grade. It's just not there anymore. So what is the problem with us making progress on the Buddhist path today is even if we were able to retune the way that you were practicing and your understanding so it fits together well, that's not enough unless you can learn it internally and practice it externally all the time. So what I am really going to ask for when people work with me is they show up with a notebook and a pen and paper or a pen, a pen and paper or a notebook and they're keeping a notebook constantly and building that because we teach in a way and we want to give you all of this now. Vanti and I are in our 70s. We want to give it all to everyone we possibly can before we're gone. So the thing is, we want you to build your own notebook and take the parts that Vanti has found that fit together and then for me to give you the pieces that connect all of this together in ways where you can see it in pictures and you can see it in PowerPoints. I've been working on this for 20 years and it's very despairing for me to come to Asia where I think people are still memorizing, but they're not. And they like to close their eyes and listen to the Dhamma talk. And you know, that's nice if I tell you a story or I tell you just a little verse before you sit in meditation, that's fine. But when we're connecting important pieces like the hindrances and then the path itself, learning it well enough, you know what you're seeing when you're sitting. What's happening, and you know, then the satipatthana, the, the refining, the refining the understanding so all the whole thing fits together and you complete it when you practice with the six R's. In, in order to help you do this, you have to be repeating, repeating, repeating. And dependent origination, the pieces, not the in-depth, complicated, academic, PhD thesis type stuff. Just seven of the links will guide you through your entire life to understand clearly how the suffering arises, what it is and how it works, and give you a, a sign to practice the six R's and let go and relax, smile and come back. This is very critical because if you do this all the time, why is it so important to me? Because I want you to have the experience of your mind changing. And when it changes, that's when your life starts to really change. That's when you feel all of a sudden there is a kind of vibrance in you and you go to a teacher and you tell us, oh my gosh, this was real. This is not just something we talk about or, or write about or read about. This was something real. And this is what ex was exciting to me. This is why I became a nun. This is why I wanted to other people never to have to suffer the way I suffered myself. And the people I met while I was suffering, never to see people have to suffer that way anymore. Why? Because the Buddhist answer is not just Nibbana. It's not just Nibbana. You don't have to die and have the final Paranibbana to be free. <laughs> Come on. You know, that's not it. If you go to 107 and you look at 107 in the Majima Nikaya, section three tells you that this was a gradual teaching, a gradual practice, and a gradual progress. And that meant it was a gradual relief. 
And this relief can see in people. You see them start letting go, letting go of the past events they always think about, letting go of their worry for the future with COVID virus, staying where they are in the present time and not just sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair, oppressing myself, throwing myself into depression, throwing myself into emotional reactions, not getting along with people. This, all this stuff disappears. It disappears. And you know why? Because your mind is shifting. And how did I tell you many times, how does the mind learn? It learns by repetition and it's right there in the text. It tells you the repetitious of repetition of what I'm telling you monks. This is what you do. When you listen to 148, you do not just hear what he's teaching about the origination, the disappearance, the gratification, the danger and the escape. He explains it all, and he even gave you exercises in the front part of that sutta. What you are supposed to walk around in your mind going, when you see something that upsets you, this is not me, this is not mine, this is not myself. Ah, I'm not in this movie, it's not personal. I can watch and see this happen, but now I know it's nothing but what it is. Because of Nietzsche, it just arises and it's there and it passes away. Let so this is what I'm telling you. Start the, uh, you, you, need, you need to write this down. So we're gonna go through a PowerPoint of stuff you've heard before, but the reason you're, we're asking you to write it down is so that you can repeat it and read it and put it on signs and all that. Okay, here we go, let's go. This is a simple, easy to understand, um, Mindfulness, a perfect tool for life's little toolbox. Keep going, yep. What is the meditation? The meditation is observing how mind's attention is moving moment to moment in order to see clearly how things work and the impersonal process of dependent origination, the Paticca Samapada. Okay? Other way, yep. Other direction. <laughs> the other direction, Dhamma Gavesi. One more. So what is the mindfulness? The mindfulness is this practice, it's the sati, and it's your observation power. The mindfulness has a quality of remembering. What we have to remember ourselves is what does it help you remember? It helps you, it reminds you to keep your observation going and it recollects what to do when any arising phenomena distracts you. This is what it does. And the successful meditation needs a highly developed skill of mindfulness. And the six R's training develops an acute skill of observation, which helps the student keep right effort going all the time. We'll, we'll see what right effort is in a minute. That's the Samawayama in the Eightfold Path. The question is, can any person learn to detect suffering? It's important to detect it because if you don't know what it is, I, how can I tell you how to let go of it? That's very simple. By learning some basic links of dependent origination, such as the contact, the feeling, the craving, the clinging, habitual tendency, and the birth of reaction, we can learn to see how suffering arises and how we can release it. Let's do it in Nepali. Fasa, Vedana, 
tanha, upadana, bhava, and jati. We're looking at the dependent origination a particular way. We're looking at it when we talk about it in relationship to one event that happens in your life at a time. Okay? That's how we're using it. So what is this Samawayama? What is right effort? It's a practice. It's a practice. It's not just about how you do your life or how it is that you, you do your meditation. It's a specific four-step practice. First, you recognize when an unwholesome state of mind has arisen. That's the signal to let go of the unwholesome mind state. And then you must continue and you bring up a wholesome mind state. And then you keep that wholesome mind state going and you build more of them. This was the basic right effort. So look at your six R's in your mind. We recognize when the tension and tightness is arising, then we let go, that was unwholesome. We let go of it and we relax our mind and bring up a smile as we return to your object of meditation or your task in life, which is your wholesome mind state. That's what we're trying to show you. This was something to do in life all the time. You can see some references at the bottom about this. So the six R's that Bhante has uh, created was called a mnemonic system of six R's. A mnemonic system is the way that we used to, when I was in school, we had a mnemonic system to remember 28 um, pieces in chemistry of the periodical table. Now you would have to have a whole paragraph to say probably because there's so many things on the periodic table now. But when I was in high school, there were 28 things we had to remember. So we made a funny, um, we made a little sentence that had the abbreviation of each one of the elements and we made up silly words to remember it. Well, this is what we did. In this case, these six steps are a way for you to remember the cycle of your meditation every time. So mindfulness remembers each step of the practice cycle and mindfulness remembers, reminds us to move on to the next step again and again and keep it going when we use it to make sure we use all of it. So we recognize, release and relax, re-smile, return and repeat only when something pulls you away. We don't try to stop the brain from thinking. That's not in the teaching of the Dhamma anywhere. Okay, that came later in certain types of commentaries. From falling back to the forceful practice that was used before the Buddha woke up. But when the Buddha woke up, that he never taught any forcefulness or any powerful making anything happen in the practice. Instead, he taught us to let go of everything and step back and watch what happens and observe what happens as things occur. Now, going through these steps very carefully, we're, I'm just going to read through them for you. Mindfulness reminds a meditator to observe any movements of mind's attention and to notice the change of any tension in the mind or in the body while he's meditating because the craving always manifests as tension and tightness in both the mind and body. So anytime you start to get tight in your body at all, you begin to learn to sense this. If you keep relaxing and softening, uh, remember, uh, don't resist 
or push, soften, and smile. It's about stepping back, letting go, stop getting personally involved. This is what's important. And then when you feel that tension start to arise, the more you practice the relaxing and letting go, you can feel it early. The observation of any arising tension, when the mind moves away from the object of meditation or from a task you're doing in life, it indicates that you're starting to think, personally think about something. The release step is very important to understand. When a feeling or thought arises, the meditator then releases it and just lets it be there without getting involved with it. Not necessary, the content of the distraction is not necessary or important for you to understand. It's insignificant. It was the tension and tightness of how this came up that you want to stop the motion of it coming up. The mechanics of how it arose are very important. So just let it go of any tightness around it. Let it be there without analyzing, no analyzing. And this is what's hard for the men, very hard. They work very hard as entrepreneurs. They become the CEO, the chief financial officer, the engineer, uh, the building construction person, and they analyze at work all day. And then we tell them, come, sit, be still. Recognize how your mind is running around. Stop. Just sit quietly see it's it's a total shock so when a feeling or thought arises the meditator releases it and just leaves it there without getting involved and the content's not important it's just to let go of the tightness around it let it be there the thought without analyzing The next one is relax. Once you release, you slide right into relaxing. And after releasing the feeling and sensation and allowing it to be there without trying to control it, there really is, you have to trust us. There really is, trust the Buddha, there is a subtle, barely noticeable tension that's left in the mind and body that's still there. So you relax, just relax the head, why? because the head's attached to the body, and where is the mind? The mind is in the head. So if mind is the forerunner, if you relax the head, it will, the body will follow. And this is a momentary opportunity when you do this relaxed step to experience relief as the true nature of cessation is revealed. What you're experiencing when you do the relaxed step is a sudden tiny spot of no craving at all. And the meditator can see this while performing the release and relax steps. You have to be quiet, you have to watch very closely inside. Note the person who's done uh, the Vipassana before is in touch with their body like a dancer, like an athlete. And if they're willing to loosen up on their practice and tune it, then all of a sudden they can feel what happens when you let go of the tension. The next one you slip into is re-smile. Now what's so big deal about the smiling is if you go to Majima Nikai number 89 and read the story in that in there in 89 section 12 is describing why did the king decide? Why did King Pasanati give the Buddha and his monks the botanical garden in his city? Why did he let him, his monks stay there for three months in the rains retreat every year for many, many years? Why did he decide to do that? You go and you find out. If you lightly smiling in the mind and slightly raising the corners of the mouth connects to your brain, this is the anatomy part of it, and it lightens the mind when you smile and it sharpens the awareness. Anytime you tighten the muscles in the corners of your mouth just by mm, like that mm, while you're sitting, mm, that's when insights can arise more easily for us to see. We can see them happen then. We can get the message then. 
Getting serious, tensing up, or frowning causes mind to become heavy, and mindfulness begins to get get dull and slow, and it becomes more difficult to see how things work. We don't want to see why they work. We want to see how they work, okay? Less one is that you return. You return to whatever you're doing as you're doing this. You return and you gently return mind's attention back to the object of meditation, the breath or rela and relaxing, or from metta back to the metta and the relaxing, all right? Then you continue on with a gentle collected mind to use your object as what? As your recentering point, it's your home base. If you're working in a task, get interested in your task, all right? Like your task. In many cases, forgive your task. If you're the one cleaning the bathroom at the campsite, just forgive it, but get it done because Anicca says, this task is starting, I'm gonna do it, it's gonna be over, so don't worry about it. That's really, just that. just do it. But love what you're doing and put loving kindness into it and do it correctly and do it, um, in a disciplined way, neatly, in daily life, if mind's attention is pulled off a task, while releasing and relaxing and re-smiling, you bring your attention back to the task and do what I just said. You smile into it and you keep going. Now you repeat the cycle. Repeating the six hours cycle over and over again fulfills right effort. It purifies mind each time that you replace the old habit of craving and clinging, which is the suffering, with a new wholesome habit of releasing, relaxing, and smiling. You're changing your mind. You're experiencing the change. The six hours also teach us the four noble truths. How do they do that? Here's your cycle one more time real quick. Recognize, release, relax, re-smile, return and repeat. That's it. So you see that you're being pulled away. You let go, relax, smile and come back. That's what you're training your mind, training your mind, training your mind. Not just when I'm talking to you here, not just in retreat, all day long. You stub your toe, you, you bump into something, you know, in the office and you want to go ow and complain and get all upset. You just say, no, look, this is just what it is and it's going to pass. I see it. I release it, relax, smile and return. And you're going to heal much better if you hurt yourself this way too. So how does it complete the Four Noble Truths is very short here. Each time you practice the six R cycle, you are actually seeing and experiencing all four Noble Truths. How? First Noble Truths, we experience suffering. The tension and tightness is coming, it's arising, and that's the suffering. We, number two, the Noble Truth. We see how craving comes up, we see the cause. I'm starting to take it personally. I'm starting to get upset. I want to think about something else. This is the craving. The third noble truth, we experience and see what happens when we experience the cessation of craving. It's the, it's the release, relax, and, and the fourth noble truth, we discover there is a cessation and we see this whole path. Now, I'm not going to do this for you now, but each time you do this practice cycle, you complete all eight folds of the eightfold path. And when we teach you the Eightfold Path, it can be taught in three ways, maybe four, but the three significant ways is you hear it taught as a general thing to the community or the family. That's one way. The second way you hear it is a delightful, all in relationship to a meditation practice. You hear how 
the meditation practice can, should be fulfilling all eight parts of the Eightfold Path. And why do I say that? Because the 37 requisites of enlightenment are what I'm teaching you and how they all fit together. And eight of those is the Eightfold Path. So we discover each cycle fulfills the Eightfold Path as we briefly experience the still point, the cessation of suffering, which was no craving within that cycle. So the summary here is that your practice, first, your practice reveals the wrong perspective of taking things personally, which supported delusion and craving and clinging and caused you suffering personally. Craving is the I like it or the I don't like it mind, right? Okay. Then every second one is every time you practice right effort, you can briefly witness the state of cessation of craving. That's still point. And you realize that this is a real state that is possible for any person to experience in life. Anybody can be taught, a truck driver, a taxi driver, a loading dock person, a waitress, a clerk, a bank person, anybody in any occupation can be taught this. Retraining mind brings us full comprehension of the Four Noble Truths, the dependent origination, and impermanence, the anicca, the suffering, and the impersonal nature of everything. The anicca, dukkha, anatta, if you learn the dependent origination properly, you automatically learn all three of the three characteristics completely. This is what he says in different places in the text. So Twim demonstrates it is possible to experience gradual relief from suffering in our day-to-day -day living and that the Buddha Dhamma is still as priceless in this century and valuable as it was in the time of the Buddha. So the cessation of craving of suffering is indeed possible today, here and now. And this was the Lord's priceless uh, gift to you, was that you can use this to reduce suffering in your life. So Buddhism, it turns out, is not a pessimistic thing at all. It's very optimistic if you understand that your practices that you are learning are supposed to be easing and changing your life from suffering to letting it go, letting it go, and training your mind. And the deeper you go, as it says in 107, it's a gradual teaching, a gradual practice, a gradual progress down to the last step of the staircase. And that's where you experience Nibbana. So this is just some things I put on here, but I, I didn't have Dhamma Gavesi's phone number. It's not correct, but I put my phone number here and tried to fix the uh, email for you. And that's an old picture. We didn't get that far. <laughs> so this is what we, we can let this go now, Dhamma Gavesi. Okay. Um, tell me what time it is. Okay. So this was a good, a good basic thing that can be used in Sunday school. It can be used in really any setting. You can do it a little bit differently. And all of a sudden, you can present it to any religion, to anybody, anywhere, anywhere. You see? And I, I've taught people, I've taught people, I've taught in taxis, I've taught in buses. When the bus driver gets all upset, you know, I teach him little things and he starts smiling and laughing and not getting upset. I taught taxis in Kuala Lumpur a lot. 
And the funniest thing was the first, I, I'm not going to tell you the whole story. I don't have time. It's Bonte's turn, but okay. But the funniest thing was teaching in a taxi in Sri Lanka. When I first discovered that I could teach taxi dhamma, and when I taught it to a taxi driver, he didn't charge me anything at the end of the ride. <laughs> and he listened very carefully, and it was a lesson on anicca, dukkha, and anatta. It wasn't anything about the, the uh, it was about letting go, relax, smile, come back. And letting go, it was the past, telling people, what good is the past? Anything that happened in the past, even this morning, why, wh why are you hanging on to it? Oh, we're going to lose our battery. Uh-oh. We we're going to lose our battery. So we got this much of a lesson, but we still don't have the um, electric will not come back on for our um, computer today. So we might end up cutting the short.